All right, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our fourth annual town hall with the Department of Agriculture. It seems incredible that we've been doing them for this long, um, and I'm really proud of this event. I think it's a really great opportunity for new CT Farmer Alliance members to connect with the Department of Ag and the Department of Ag to share some of the stuff that they've got going on with us. Um, so if by some chance this is your first NICTFA event, um, I'll just fill you in on our mission. The mission of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance is to bring together emerging and existing producers from across Connecticut to network, share resources, identify common challenges and opportunities for a more accessible, successful, and diverse agricultural community. Um, we do this in a whole variety of ways. I would say first and foremost, our mission is to build community among farmers and help folks feel like they have other farmers that they can really rely on. Um, and we do this through farmer to farmer education, events, farmer circles, and increasingly through um, some policy work. So that's kind of how this town hall came to be. If you wanna get more involved in the Alliance, um, you can become a member on our website, newcgfarmers.com. We also have a dedicated uh, policy working group that meets typically on Monday evenings. Um, if you wanna get involved in that, just email me, newcgfarmers at gmail.com. Um, we also have our annual Hootenanny, which is a really fun event. It'll be at a brewery and it's basically a time for NICFA to share what we've been up to this year. We elect the steering committee at this event um, and we get input from the members on all sorts of different things that you wanna see from us in terms of programming. And then another great way to get involved um, could be to volunteer to host a gathering on your farm this summer. So hope you will uh, see you at the next event. Um, all right. Without further ado, I'm just going to pass it over to Brian Hurlbert for your presentation. And then at 7 p.m. sharp, we'll transition to the Q&A portion. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and walk through the uh, presentation here. Um, I'm expecting that I'll probably answer a number of questions in, uh, in the presentation, but I wanted to make sure um, that we talked a little bit about what the department's up to, uh, where we're headed. Um, some of the, the current projects. I will share this with MC um, and make sure that you guys all have a copy of it um, so that uh, for people who missed it or missed a, a data point, um, that you have uh, the opportunity to go back um, and uh, take a look at it. So first, I, I agree, MC. I can't believe this is our fourth one. Um, I appreciate um, you're always um, reaching out and, and asking for these and putting together putting them together. I think that demonstrates uh, there's value in these in these uh, conversations, um, and um, that's always good. It's always good to communicate. It's always good to know that um, what we're sharing and when we have the opportunity to share um, that um, that uh, the the information is is useful and helpful. Um, so digging in here, um, I always like to start off, and I, I'm going to be looking over here, actually over here, um, which is uh, my other screen where I have the presentation up. So um, don't think that I'm staring off into the distance. I'm, I'm just paying attention to the slides here. Um, uh, I always like to start off with a mission statement um, to kind of baseline where we are as an agency, what our role is, and what we have responsibilities to. Um, uh, a lot of uh, people think that we have the ability to control everything. Um, in, in agriculture, and we have a lane. Uh, we're very aware of our lane, um, and we try to work with our partners um, where uh, subject matter doesn't fall into our mission. So the mission is to foster healthy economic, environmental, and social climate for agriculture by developing, promoting, and regulating agricultural businesses, protecting agriculture and agricultural and aquaculture resources, enforcing laws pertaining to domestic animals, promoting an understanding among the state citizens of the diversity of Connecticut's agriculture, its cultural heritage, and its contribution to the state's economy. Um, so that's not narrow, but it is um, not, uh, not completely broad. And I think part of what's interesting about our responsibility versus some of my sister agencies in state government um, is that we are responsible with developing, promoting, and regulating. A lot of other agencies have a sole lane of regulation. Um, and, uh, and we're unique in that way. So a broad uh, snapshot of Connecticut agriculture. Um, the Ag Census came out uh, on Tuesday, um, 5,058 farms, um, down from about 5,500 farms in the 2017 census. Um, $4 billion in economic impact, 22,000 jobs, 272,000 acres. Um, those are uh, all average uh, or, or stable. The average farm size actually increased 
5.5 acres, went from 69 to 74 acres. Um, and 32% of the respondents um, were new and beginning farmers and 41% are female. Um, I will say, if you hadn't responded to the mass survey, it's really important that uh, everybody does. The trigger is $1,000 worth of agricultural goods and services per year. Now, the state trigger is 2,500. Um, so the more people that respond to this, the better our data will be, the better our data is, um, the more uh, reflective it will be on the industry, but also USDA runs um, programming amounts based on ag census numbers. So if we under report, we actually don't get as much money as uh, other states do on a per farmer basis. So um, that's really important to, um, uh, to share with everybody about why we do that. Um, also, wanted to test base, the governor's budget was released last week. Um, the proposal is 50 responsible within the state spending cap and adheres to the guardrails that were adopted in the 2017 budget. Um, it's a 3.5% adjustment over the previous year. Um, importantly for us, there were no cuts to program staff or, uh, or our funding. Uh, unfortunately, the only increase was a $50,000 um, uh, program line item for the uh, Public Act 490 land value um, report that we put out every five years. Um, so we used to have to take that from within current funds, so it's better than not receiving it. Um, but honestly, there were minimum changes to any state agency um, other than uh, the Office of Early Childhood. Um, importantly, it, re it extends the reduced school lunches and free school breakfast to qualifying districts. It funds agri-science students with statutory mandate. Um, and it increases tourism by a million dollars, which given the work that we do with the Department of Economic and Community Development, um, on their tours of the campaign, I do believe we will see uh, a benefit from that. Recently, the governor challenged um, all of us in the cabinet to uh, talk about what uh, the 10-year vision is for the agency and the industries that we are responsible to. Um, and so what I was able to report out was um, our goal is to continue to grow and diversify agriculture by building and supporting a sustainable and equitable agricultural industry and food supply chain in Connecticut. We can achieve this by increasing, increasing what we grow, how we grow it, where it's grown, and who is growing it. And you're gonna see that theme of, uh, of, of, of adding to who we grow, what we grow, where we grow, and who is growing it throughout our uh, program um, during the course of this presentation. Um, we think about this on a day-to-day -day basis at the agency. Uh, as we develop programs, we're thinking about this. As we're reviewing uh, program applications, we're thinking about this. Um, so it mirrors the effort that we put into our DEI report and the working group and the effort that um, those individuals contributed to, um, to make sure um, that we're adhering to, um, to that responsibility um, uh, from, the, from the industry. Quickly, the organization, we have my office, uh, Agricultural Development and Resource Conservation. Jamie Smith is here. She was a little bit under the weather, so I'm going to do most of the talking. She'll probably just um, chime in if, uh, if uh, I get something a little off. Um, the Bureau of Aquaculture, um, that's our kelp, uh, uh, oysters, uh, seafood. Um, David Carey is the point person down there. Uh, regulatory Services, new hire, Alexander Duffy is our new uh, Bureau Director. Uh, he comes to us from the private sector. He's doing a great job. Um, most of the uh, uh, aquaculture and reg services stuff um, are, is not in here. I wanted to focus on our grants. I thought that was the most um, <clears throat> most interesting to your members. Um, but MC, if anybody has a question, you know, they can certainly email uh, David or Alex and, uh, and talk to them about it. We do have um, some new and beginning farmer work happening in aquaculture. It's actually pretty cool and exciting. Um, but uh, but I, I didn't think we'd have um, anybody in, the, in that space uh, here tonight. If I'm wrong, happy to connect you with David directly. Um, so we'll run through a number of grants. I also want to highlight that um, a few years ago, we would not have had nearly as many grants to talk about. Um, we have been increasing our grant portfolio. We have been increasing the dollars in our grants. We have been uh, increasing the number of awards we're making per grant. Um, so our farm transition grant, which um, just closed, uh, I think on the 31st, um, diversification of operations, value added adaptation, um, it's a competitive matching grant. Uh, there are four categories that uh, people can apply to. For this year, we just reviewed the potential awardees 
Uh, we're awarding 39 awards out of 71 applications uh, for $643,000. Um, we had 22 new farmer micro grant applications. Uh, 17 of those are going to be funded. Um, within that 22, 10 self-identified as BIPOC farmers. Uh, we're going to be able to identify, we're going to be able to fund five of those. Really importantly, the number of new farmer micro grant applications is up 50%. Um, and the number of BIPOC applications is up 150%. Um, so, you know, the target that we're trying to reach, a new audience, making sure that people are aware that these exist, is working. Now, we only had 10 BIPOC farm applications. So there's a, a little bit of runway left for us here, to be honest. And, and, you know, we recognize that. But last year, we had four. Um, so we will continue this effort and continue this progress. Um, and I'm really excited that we're able to uh, support 17 of these um, micro uh, uh, grant applications, $5,000 award, $5,000 award. There's some really neat stuff um, that uh, I have to wait for Rebecca to send out the press release before I can share. Um, but, uh, but I think everybody's going to be excited um, when they see uh, what, what types of um, uh, projects were awarded. Um, and we have our success story. You know, this is a good way for people who are thinking about what they want to do next on the farm um, to think about what other people have done and what has been funded previously um, and generate, you know, an idea, oh, that's eligible for a grant. Okay, I needed to do that anyway. So go in there and check that out. Um, it's updated when we do the, the uh, new releases, um, but it should generate some, uh, some thought process. Our Ag Enhancement Grant, this used to be called our, our Farm Viability Grant. Um, we changed um, the name because we changed who is eligible. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were moving further along the supply chain. Um, we Before, we were only really able um, to um, reach people who are directly engaged in agriculture, planning for agriculture. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call are aware of Healthy Planning. They were not eligible for our grant programs previously. Um, I thought that was really a shame because they're doing a lot of work. Rosemary's doing a great job of um, connecting farmers and consumers, um, but she's not in, she was not an eligible entity. Um, so we wanted to expand it for organizations like hers to be eligible for this because they're really important um, in the ag uh, industry. Um, not everybody has the ability to do that sort of aggregation and move up the supply chain. Um, so we, we extended that. I uh, wanted to point out on here, um, areas of focus, DEI, urban ag, farmland access, um, and youth. You know, uh, MC, Robert, we were just at the uh, farm manager's event yesterday and talking about farm labor, um, you know, talking about going upstream further and further um, to engage uh, Connecticut youth uh, about and, and, and get them interested in agriculture. Um, so um, <clears throat> those are areas that we prioritize. Um, for awards. Last year, we doubled the amount, more than doubled the amount of funding we distributed and uh, more than doubled the amount of uh, awards. Um, so again, progress, still work to do, um, but we're, we're getting there. We uh, released the Farmland Restoration Climate Resiliency and Preparedness Grant, or short RRP, um, competitive matching grant to increase climate resiliency and to develop a farmland restoration climate resiliency plan. Um, some of your members may be familiar with the Farmland Restoration Grant Program that we ran from, I think, 2020, uh, 2012 to 2022, um, 23. Um, this is an enhancement and extension of that. Um, so we're increasing what is eligible, um, the scope of what is eligible. Um, and we, we designated um, two different types of um, projects. New and Beginning Farmer, BIPOC, Veteran Farmer, a uh, smaller award, but smaller pool of uh, competitors um, uh, to uh, compete against for the application. Um, and then Group B, a larger, um, uh, that would be uh, all other eligible farmers um, with a larger amount. Um, we will be um, releasing those contracts. Um, essentially, what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, hiring soil scientists to work with individual farms to develop their um, farmland restoration climate resiliency plan. Um, we pay for that 100%. And then um, based on what that plan includes, we will do a reimbursement um, or cash advance and reimbursement to actually to execute against that plan. 
Um, so it's going to be a little bit longer term, um, you know, 50 or $100,000. The previous restoration grant maxed out at $20,000. So this is a big increase. Um, so you should be able to do more on your farm um, uh, with this grant um, over a longer period of time. Um, and, um, and if we are not able to fund all of the work, you will still have a plan as to what else can or should be done uh, to increase the resiliency. This was based off of the, um, uh, partially in response to, I should say, the um, weather events that we had uh, over the course of 2023 between the frost freeze events, the two frost freeze events, the major flooding event along the Connecticut River, um, and then the continued rain uh, that we received uh, after that. Connecticut Grown for Connecticut Kids, um, great program, um, 53 awards this year. This connects um, uh, farmers uh, with schools, child care centers, family child care homes, um, or any administer uh, any organization that administers the farm school program. So basically, if they have kids, access to kids, um, uh, they can um, put together a, an application for this. Um, this year, we had $2 million available for container farm awards. Um, eight of those were awarded. So we maxed out the dollars that we had. Um, and I, I highlighted this. Uh, part of our DEI uh, working group report was that we need to be better about um, accepting and promoting our programs in different languages. Um, and for the first time, I would say ever, um, we had two applications that came to us in Spanish. Um, again, you know, we're working on this, we're, we're dedicating access to it, um, and we're seeing some results. So um, really excited about that. Um, and, you know, it, it's a beacon that says we're headed in the right direction. Um, but 53 awards, it's, uh, we had, I think, 71 awards on this one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, we had a, a, over 100 awards on this one. Um, so very competitive, um, very competitive program. Resilient Food uh, System Infrastructure Program. Uh, this was announced last week. This is for um, expanding capacity and aggregation, processing, manufacturing, storing, transporting, wholesaling, distribution of locally and regionally produced food products. Basically the middle of that supply chain, that value add um, piece. Uh, this was a USDA uh, grant um, that we received. Um, it, importantly, it excludes meat and poultry. USDA's uh, feeling was that the rural development um, grant, they put a billion dollars out there for meat processing, protein processing. Um, they didn't want that to compete with this program. So that was an, an internal decision. Um, that was part of the program requirements from USDA. Got just over $2 million to award. Um, the first round will be the infrastructure grant program up to a quarter of a million dollars. Um, importantly, uh, everybody should be aware. Um, the uh, grant webinar will be next week. So our grant documents are online and available. Um, but next week will be the opportunity to sit and listen to um, our program team go through it um, and make sure that you have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I also want to point out that these projects must benefit more than one producer organization. So this is building supply chain. So think about healthy planning again. You know, people who are bringing uh, you know uh, raw goods together, either processing it or, or redistributing it. Farmers Preservation, banner year last year. Uh, big kudos to Jamie, Sam, and the team. Um, this is our uh, development right purchasing program. Uh, it's limited to those uh, parcels that have significant prime and important soils. Um, we are paying 100% of the appraisal. So basically we're maxing out our contribution. Um, we are getting closer and closer to two year closing. Um, our community farmland preservation program is back online. We had to put pause uh, for um, last year while we redid the regulations. Those were adopted by the legislature in uh, mid-November. Um, they were posted and published in December. Um, so we are processing the applications that were in the queue um, there. Um, I want to point out, because this was a, a question uh, that was submitted uh, on the front end, uh, we cannot use these funds for urban ag projects. Um, uh, I shouldn't say we can't. We can use these funds on an urban ag project if an urban ag project qualifies based on their soils. And given the soils and urban areas in Connecticut and our history of manufacturing and heavy metals, um, it is highly unlikely that uh, a parcel would qualify. Um, so that is not within our ability to create an urban ag preservation program under our current funding or statutory authorities. Um, but last year, we protected 23 farm parcels, over 1,500 acres. 
um, and uh, about $10 million um, that was invested in the ag economy across the state. Um, to put it in perspective, um, the year before was under 10 farms and under 700 acres. Um, so we were really able to ramp up. A couple of reasons we we're able to do that. One, our team is just a little bit better now. Um, you know, as some of you know, Holly and Simon, they're, they're hitting their stride. You know, they've uh, matured in their role. Um, they know the ins and outs and the nuances of the program. Um, so they're able to be, uh, you know, a lot, um, a lot quicker with their, with their processing. Um, and RCS has fully staffed up and, and they had the same growth curve um, as their new people learn uh, about uh, the program. Uh, our partners at CFT um, were hitting their strike as well, helping us through, the, through these projects. Um, we also became a certified entity, which means uh, we, we applied to NRCS to demonstrate that our program is, is great and we are competent um, and we met the, the paperwork requirements. So that reduces the NRCS oversight and auditing and paperwork that we have to do. Um, so a lot of things came together. Um, I think we're going to see um, numbers that are going to be close to this this year, um, but, uh, but that, was, that was the largest single year for farmland preservation effort in the 42 year history of the, the program. So, you know, when we're, we're talking about, you know, progress on here, you know, we are hitting a lot of benchmarks um, uh, that we hadn't seen previously. Wanted to bring up FarmLink. I'm not sure if your members are aware, but it's an opportunity to connect owners and farmers with uh, uh, potential matchmaking services. Uh, partnership with FarmLand Trust, Land for Good works with us on this as well. Um, but I strongly suggest that people um, check out the site, um, get a feel for what's out there, uh, or refer to a friend. Um, getting to the pre-submitted questions, um, there was a question regarding our ability to reduce cost share requirements. Um, the statute requires matches in our, in our program. We don't have the flexibility um, to eliminate uh, match uh, requirements. What we do have is the ability to reduce it where we can, and we are being as flexible as we possibly can on this. So for instance, the farm transition grant, that new and beginning micro farmer uh, program, it's a 25% match. Salaries count. So the farm work that is happening is eligible to meet that match requirement. Um, we do wanna have uh, the, the grantee have some skin in the game um, and have some ownership of the project. Um, so I do think it's important that the match requirement uh, remain, um, but we want to be as flexible as we can because we don't want the match and the, and the need to come up with um, a match to prevent somebody from applying. Our numbers are off the charts when it comes to applications. So we have, we have overcome the issue of people not being willing to apply at this point. Um, so our, our applications are getting a lot more competitive um, when we do the awards as well. So we, we have to now kind of think about, um, you know, where that, where that sweet spot is um, regarding match and applications. Um, but the goal is that we have people who are able um, to apply for the grants because they know they will be able to fulfill the requirements for them. Um, what, are, what efforts are we taking to increase urban agriculture and access to land? Um, both transition and ag enhancement grants identify urban agriculture as priority areas. Um, and so uh, if people come to us, that you know, kind of gets a bump in their, in their review panel of score sheet. Um, we don't have, as I mentioned before, the ability to purchase land. Um, that's, we, don't, we don't have funding for that or um, a statutory program that would allow us to do that. Um, we have been talking about it. We've been talking to OPM about it, um, but it has not been uh, created yet. We would need that sort of program to support that work from a departmental level. Um, NRCS has challenges on urban ag lands as well, but we can support the farmer um, when they get on that land. Um, we can help them through that process. We can help them with tools to, to support them to getting onto the land. Um, and we have made a number of grants, uh, Level International um, comes quickly to mind, um, to, uh, to uh, farmers uh, and organizations that are increasing production on urban la ag land um, in our city. Um, we funded GDI for a number of projects, the city seed, um, Brass City Harvest, um, uh, out in Danbury, we've done some projects. 
So um, we are doing more than we've done before, um, but if the, if the desire is for a farmland preservation type program, um, we do not have the ability to do that. So we're using the tools that we have um, and leveraging them to the best of our ability to, um, to uh, achieve that outcome. Health insurance and retirement. Um, Access Health CT is the small business um, insurance program that the state offers and is available. I, I suggest that members um, take a look at that and call them through the exchange, um, see what would be available and what they're eligible for. And then the um, Connecticut recently rolled out the MyCT Savings Program, which is a retirement program uh, overseen by the comptroller, um, but for uh, eligible um, employer employers with five or more employees um, uh, are required, um, but you have the opportunity um, to enroll. So that's a, a new tool that's out there um, for, for small businesses uh, in the state. The Access Health has been around for a couple more years. Um, land Capital and Market Access Program. We're patiently waiting on USDA. Uh, um, uh, this would uh, this program we applied for in November of 2022. Uh, it was announced in May of 2023. Uh, we have been working with them uh, consistently at USDA um, to move forward on this. We have subcontracts uh, awarded, um, but we actually can't execute until we get the green light from USDA. Uh, I actually was talking to uh, some people at USDA uh, last week trying to push this along um, because we know there's a need out here. Um, we know that there's a desire for this and people have been patiently waiting um, to execute. Um, but this would provide technical assistance for BIPOC producers to grow their farm business, help navigate available resources, um, a, a down payment assistance program. Um, we'll work with Yukon Extension ASP um, to do the distribution and technical assistance. Um, but again, we're waiting on, uh, on USDA before we can actually start the work. Um, and I know uh, everybody who's involved is very excited about it, as are we. We were really excited last May when, when we got the announcement that we were awarded. Um, this was a competitive grant, um, so uh, the department chose to apply for this, um, and we were one of the uh, national awardees. So um, really excited that uh, that um, Jamie and Serena came to, to uh, the table and said, this is something we should pursue, um, put together a great application with some partner organizations uh, to receive funding. That is a minute early, MC. Um, so I, I'll take a gold star for running through all that material that quickly. Um, but Jamie did raise her hand. I want to make sure that she has uh, the opportunity to, to contribute to. Um, I'll make it really quick, MC. Thanks, Commish, for running through that. Um, on the regional food system infrastructure grant, I do want to just highlight on that program, we are um, working with the Small Business Development Center. They are hiring a dedicated employee to work with agricultural producers who are looking to not only um, apply for this funding, we will be offering two rounds of grant funding. We have the one currently available. We'll be releasing one um, probably, oh gosh, I'm getting my dates a little mushed up, but we're going to be releasing a second round of funding that is um, has no match requirement um, and is dedicated just for producers. So this first round is for um, has to have beneficiaries that are beyond just the applicant, whereas the future round has no match and um, can benefit just the producer. Um, so the Small Business Development Center will be available to help with that, along with BFOC. They will also be supporting um, the program and helping with uh, business development, along with the CARAT project. So those are our three partners on that program, which there is absolutely no way we could do without them. So, um, And I'm really excited to see some dedicated ag staff join the Small Business Development Center. Um, and I just, just plugged in the date, Jamie. Uh, thank it's you. February 2025 when uh, that second round comes through. Awesome. Yeah, we got a, a pretty long time span on that one. And also um, on the Land Capital Market Access Grant, our agreements have been drafted and we're just waiting for the green light to be able to release them. So with the USDA. Um, well, we 
are statutorily required to provide or require a um, match on many of our grant programs. The one area that we do have flexibility on is um, the potential to advance funds. And that's something that we have started doing. And um, from a, a grantor perspective, it's very risky, frankly, for us to be releasing funds. Um, but it is by far one of the ways that we've seen projects uh, enabled to be successful because they have uh, funds up front, at, right? And so a 50% cash match can be really meaningful on a, you know, $40,000 grant award. So um, that is the one area that uh, we are trying to do better on. Um, and then on the farmland side, I just want to say, since the regulations have been passed, we have seen a number of parcels and applications um, that have been sitting waiting to be scored that previously would not have scored at all, just because they're small. So um, they do have the necessary soil, so that still is an important piece, but smaller parcels in more suburban areas. Um, so it's a step in the right direction, but as Commissioner already mentioned, if we want to hit that urban aspect, um, some new statutory language will be necessary. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say is, as you can see, we have so many grant opportunities coming down the pipe. And if y'all have any suggestions or ways for us to communicate this information differently to your membership, there's a lot out there and it can get very overwhelming. We're creating a dedicated um, grants page on our website, sort of how to, um, where everyone needs like standard forms and things like that. Um, but if you have any thoughts, we've been playing with this decision tree thing and it's, it gets really complicated really fast. So if you have any thoughts on how we can communicate our grant opportunities better, by all means, I am more than happy to take suggestions. So, and thank you, Kamish, for uh, carrying the water on that, on those topics. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. I wasn't expecting you to be here, but I'm glad you are. Because those were great points to, to add to the conversation. Yeah, that was great. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, so now for the open portion of the questionnaire, uh, open portion of the town hall. Um, if folks could just raise your hands if you have a question, and then I can call on you, or you can put your questions in the chat, and I will read them aloud. Um, because it was the first question, and uh, Robert was already ready to go. I will start with your question, Robert. Um, Robert Chang asks, as grant applications increase and become more competitive, does that form the basis for requesting more funding for these programs from the legislature in the future? Well, I, I'm not allowed to ask for more funding. You know, that, that can be uh, your, your individual discussion, but, you know, they are getting really competitive. Um, and uh, just today, in fact, as we were reviewing the um, transition grant, um, you know, 70 over 70 applications. Um, you know, we stretched as far as we could go. Um, we, we prioritized the micro grant uh, program. Um, but there were, you know, out of, basically, if you scored about above a 40 out of the 60 available points, um, you were in the running. And there were a couple that were, that did not make a cut, um, that, uh, that scored pretty good. They looked like they were going to be meaningful projects. Um, but given how competitive, um, the other uh, applications were, um, you know, their their application and some of the supporting documents kind of caused them to drop off. Um, so, you know, some of these programs, Transition uh, and Ag Enhancement, are funded by the CIA. Um, so that isn't a direct line item. Um, that is uh, formula based. Um, so um, that would require um, a, a revision to the um, CIA Community Investment Account. Um, that uh, we share with housing and DECD. Um, that also supports our dairy uh, programming. Um, but, um, but I mean, a couple of things, right? I don't think I have to tell anybody on this call, things are getting more expensive. Um, so $5,000 uh, in 2007, when, this, uh, when these programs were initiated, um, is not the same as $5,000 today. Um, and, um, you know, part of what our, our goal is, is to, um, get more money to more farms that is more meaningful. Um, and um, it's, it's 
harder and harder to do that when um, when the pot does not meet, you know, does not equal the same value um, that it has uh, previously. Um, but Robert, I'll, I'll leave it to you to talk to, to, to the legislature, um, but the data is out there. Um, we do, you know, send out as part of our press releases on our, on our program. Um, you know, we awarded, you know, uh, Canada Girls with United Kids 53, we had 115 applications. You know, when we, we awarded $2.8 million, we had, you know, I think it was, you know, close to $4 million uh, that were applied for um, to demonstrate that demand. And then Kaylee Royston, uh, our Director of Government uh, Relations, um, emailed that out to each individual legislator who had a project in their district or in their town um, that, that was awarded. So we're trying to elevate, you know, the, the impact of those awards and get to the, the legislature to remind them why this is important. So if they visit that farm, um, you know, they can have that conversation. We also, as part of that email that Kaylee sends out is, is, an, is an open invitation that if they want to go visit the farm, I'm happy to, to get there with them. That's Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. You know, we will go out, have that conversation with the farmer, talk about their experience um, with the grant process um, and what that award means to them. And those are really compelling conversations because, you know, it's, it's as real as it can be. Thanks, Commissioner, and thanks, Robert, for that question. Um, I see Alicia, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I received a farm transition grant, a small one, for Raspberry Hill Farm. I'm very grateful for it, and I'm a freeze dryer that will enable me to freeze dry my berries and, and just sort of move things along besides that near a window when they're ready. My challenge is that... Um, um, my berries are harvested in July, which got rained on completely, and I lost my crop, and I was supposed to increase sales by 10%, um, and I lost 90% of my crop. So um, are there alternatives? Are there? I tried to do some other things. I took a mark, couple, two marketing workshops, and I tried to do other things to kind of like participate, but um, do, do you have any suggestions about what happens in a situation like that? Yeah, we're we're terrible to work with, Alicia. So, um, you know, no, I, I'm just kidding. One, I remember specifically reviewing your application, um, oh. and and uh, excited that you're here. Um, you know, these these uh, micro grants are really impactful and really powerful. Um, yes. And yes. you know, of all the things that we do at the agency, we do a lot well, um, but. Uh, these are some of the most meaningful grants um, that we're able to award. And, um, you know, we were talking about, um, uh, while we're reviewing these grants, you know, I was talking with the team about, you know, it's not just an investment in, in the farm and, and putting a piece of equipment or uh, something within reach. It's also, in my opinion, it's an investment in confidence, um, you know, that, that you're a farmer now, you're a farm business, you're legit, you're getting grants, you're, you're taking things to market, and, and we want you to continue to grow that, whether that be, you know, from part-time to less, you know, uh, a full-time job somewhere else to a full-time farmer. But that path has to start somewhere. Um, and you only have so much uh, sweat equity that you can invest. Um, so we want to give you that next boost. Um, you know, nobody is doubting that last year was a terrible year. Um, and so, um, you know, the work that you did um, doesn't reflect the results that you received. So, um, work with us uh, on this, um, you know, I think we'd be happy to, to find ways to extend the reporting period or, or, or uh, capture the impact. Um, because if, if you were able to manage 38 inches of rain, like some farms across the state uh, had um, last year and, and get a crop to market, then you should be giving these presentations because you have a secret that, uh, that a lot of people really um, want to know. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, you know, last year was really challenging year. Um, so, um, thank you for trying to do these other events and participate in the other, uh, webinars and forums. Um, I would suggest you should connect with NRCS, um, and see what other programs they have, um, that can help, uh, mitigate some of the impacts of, of the amount of water or drought that we have. Um, so, um, please. Um, take advantage uh, of those tools as well. But yeah, talk to talk to our team and you know we'll, we'll figure out a solution. Um, the goal is not to claw the money back. That's not gonna help anybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for that question, Alicia. Um, we've got a question in the chat from William, William Gates. DEEP currently regulates new composting facilities. In order to promote composting for ag, is there anything DOAG can do to promote more compost facilities to increase compost supply? Um, yeah, we actually, uh, two weeks ago, we were um, at an event with Connecticut Resource Conservation and Development uh, promoting um, their uh, re-granting of their Climate Smart Ag and Forestry uh, grant work, the initial round $250,000 to eight farms across the state. Um, one of their awardees uh, um, uh, was uh, a farm that's going to be doing composting um, to increase that. We, we looked at that um, for um, uh, part of our Climate Smart Ag and Forestry grant program. Um, uh, we found well, we felt that the best way um, to reach that that uh, that outcome was to do the regranting. So uh, RC and D uh, has done that. Um, you know that's one way. Um, our transition uh, grants are, are eligible for that. Uh, we work with DEEP on these. So um, if you have a, a project in mind, uh, give us a call um, and we'll see what we can do and see how we can facilitate. And, and Robert had a question about what the CIA is. And I apologize, I, I had glossed over that uh, previously. So the Community Investment Act um, was created in 2006 um, to fund equally housing, historic preservation, um, uh, farmland uh, preservation and um, our ag viability program. Um, it is generated off the dollar um, that you pay when you record a deed. So when you purchase a house, a portion of that funds goes um, to the state, some of that goes to the town, uh, some of it is divvied up amongst these different programs. Um, so that's what funds uh, some of our programs at the agency. So they're not line items in the state budget. Um, they are, uh, that's why I said they're formulaic. So based on the total amount of money that's available, um, we get a portion of that for these individual programs. So um, some of them flex uh, during the course of years, over, over years, um, but our goal is to spend those down um, uh, as they are available. They do roll over. It's not like the general fund dollars that last at the end of the fiscal year. Um, they do roll over, um, but they're not doing anybody any good by sitting um, in, um, uh, in a in an account uh, at over at OPM, so we're trying to spend that down. And for that transition grant, um, uh, we're going to be within three hundred dollars of uh, of maxing out on the account. Thanks for that um, explanation. That's really helpful. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Pete Seppi, which I remember coming up in last year's town hall and maybe even the one before, which is about processing capacity of USDA from August through January. There are plenty of butchers under the Department of Public Health, but they can't process for Pete for resale. Livestock producers need help to get their livestock processed. So what is the department doing about livestock processing capacity? Yeah, we, we've made a number of investments in livestock processing over the years. Um, in fact, you'll see that one of the, one of the announcements that we're going to make on uh, transition grant is livestock processing. Um, we made an investment in a processing facility in uh, our Climate Smart Ag and Forestry grant uh, program, recognizing that this was a huge need that's out there. Um, we, we actually were working with a uh, processor uh, on getting insurance uh, for uh, their operation. Um, so it's, it's well recognized. We're using all the tools that we can um, to, uh, to address this. Uh, Pete's right. This is a Department of Public Health uh, regulation. Um, and it's something that the Department of uh, Public Health uh, has to weigh in on. Um, and it's not something that's within our control or ability to change. Um, we actually, in fact, we, we've made a couple other uh, processing investments, uh, Mash and Tucket. Uh, Pequot Tribal Nation um, is going to be putting together or taking a proposal for a processing facility to the Tribal Council. Um, I spoke with their department uh, head um, uh, last week. Um, we're going to be submitting a letter of support for the council to be uh, aware of that there is this tremendous need out there, not only in Connecticut, um, but across um, the Northeast. Um, and, and, and we need to do what we can to invest in processing capacity. Um, and uh, I give the Mash and Tucket Pequot Tribal Nation a lot of credit. Um, they said this will be open to the greater agriculture community. This will not be limited to processing their own um, animals. They're, they understand the value um, uh, to uh, opening up. So, um, you know, th there will be continued efforts on this. Um, we're doing everything we can to invest in the facilities that are there. 
um, and make sure that people are are aware. I'll I'll share this. Um, three years in a row, um, I uh, submitted an app, uh, a, a propo legislative proposal to allow for rabbit processing, recognizing that uh, you know it's a affordable protein, easily e easy to raise, entry level. You don't need a lot of land. You don't need a lot of feed. They, as we all know, re reproduce relatively quickly. Um, and grow to market size relatively quickly. So great starting point if a, for a farmer to get into um, uh, raising animals. Uh, um, you can take those animals to uh, to a USDA facility, um, but the, it just becomes cost prohibitive. It, it increases the cost uh, on a per pound basis tremendously. Um, and so it really limits the market uh, as to who uh, would be willing to, to afford um, rabbits. Um, the legislature, for three years in a row has told me no, that they don't see the value in this, that you know, we're not gonna encourage people to eat bunnies. You know, these are bunnies, these are pets, these are, you know, uh, furry little things that people want to play with. They're, you know, they're not part of the food supply chain. Um, I've done my best to, to educate uh, members of the legislature on this. Um, you know, we we were starting a negotiation with one uh, very vocal uh, animal advocate and the chair of the animal advocacy caucus up there. But okay, you know, the number we proposed was 1,000. That's the USDA um, uh, maximum that would fall in line with our poultry processing, so our, our chicken and turkey processing um, uh, 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 program that we have. Um, so, you know, if you want to move from that number of 1,000, what's the number you want? And he looked at Kaylee with a straight face and said 12. Okay, we're not negotiating, right? Like that's not a starting point. You know that that's not a that's not a feasible business model for a farmer to do twelve animals a year, right? That's that's not worth the effort. Um, so you know we know of the issue. Um, we're trying to do what we can through the avenues that we have available to us uh, on this issue. But the legislature really needs to hear from farmers that this would be an important avenue for them because I can tell you, um, you know, there were uh, you know. Hundreds of people signed up to testify against the bill last year. Um, three op-eds written against it by uh, various uh, uh, advocacy organizations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a tough battle. Um, so if we're struggling with rabbit processing, you know, we are really in an uphill um, battle to get anything more. New processing facilities, expansion processing facilities. I'm not, I mean, I, quite honestly, I'm surprised that they haven't uh, tried to restrict my ability to award uh, processing grants. Um, so uh, it's you know it's very frustrating to um, to recognize that there's this tremendous need and opportunity um, out there in the marketplace um, that the legislature is restricting um, based on you know a, a, a you know a misunderstanding of of what we're trying to accomplish and who would benefit from it. That's really useful uh, context. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, to get another voice other than mine asking a question, I'll call on Morgan Wilson, who's got their hand raised. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Okay, wonderful. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Commissioner and Department of Ag, thank you guys very much for participating in this uh, town hall tonight. Uh, my question has to do with uh, compliance. That is an ever-bearing issue for all of us right now. Um, Specifically for me, I'm asking about uh, wine, Connecticut farm winery licenses. Um, you know, right now, currently, the state of Connecticut, there's a separate license in the Department of Agriculture and another one in the Department of Consumer Protection. Uh, it's a bit redundant, but, you know, that's my area. And I'm sure other folks and other avenues of farming and agriculture have a lot of redundancy and, you um, you know, just a lot to keep up with. And I was wondering if there was anything the Department of Agriculture might have to say about streamlining some of this or perhaps consolidating it, communicating better with the uh, Department of Consumer Protection. Um, just wanted to hear if there was any news in that regard. Yeah, great question, Morgan. Um, uh, we've paid attention to this. We're, we're fully aware of it. Um, and we like it the way it is, quite honestly. Um, the the uh, DCP is for uh, a wine manufacturing summit. Um, mm -hmm. which means you don't have to have uh, any crops or any of your land in production. Um, and in order to participate in the Farm Winery Task Force program and benefit um, those operations that are raising their own grapes, processing on site, uh, manufacturing, um, that's the, the $25 fee mm -hmm. is the way that we are able um, to um, enforce that um, only 
Connecticut farm wineries are going to be eligible to participate in the farm winery task force program. Um, I get that it's a little bit redundant, but we don't have any other tools based on the, the statutory uh, program uh, to differentiate between a wine manufacturer and a farm winery. And, and that's really important uh, to be in uh, compliance with the statute um, and the Farm Wine Development Council, which uh, runs the task force program, uh, has, been, has been very steadfast that this is a farm winery program uh, that is not open to uh, any wine manufacturer. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, clarifying and uh, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Morgan, for your question. Um, I also see a question in the chat from Gavin Curran. Um, he's wondering, will there be a BIPOC apprenticeship grant again this year as there was last growing season? And I would also add to that, um, like what feedback did the department get about that program? And do you think that it's a, a good program worth funding again um, from whatever source? Um, uh, we were able to use our specialty crop block grant funding for that, which uh, supported the DEI working group. So we don't have a fund um, for that currently. Um, but Jamie, I'll let you answer the question about you know the, the uh, results and feedback on it. Um, overall, we heard such wonderful things about the program and um, the number of folks that participated from the apprentice, excuse me, from the mentor side and then bringing on the apprentice side. Um, it was absolutely something that we want to do again, but to commissioner's point, we don't have dedicated funding for it. Um, if another organization were to apply to the specialty crop block grant to run the program, that would absolutely be acceptable. We didn't really talk about the specialty crop block grant program that's not really open to producers. Um, but it is open to organizations like New Connecticut Farmer Alliance, um, NEFOC, any commodity association would be eligible to apply. And I'll drop a link in the chat so that um, if you want to learn more about it, you certainly could. But I was really, really glad that um, we were able to, Serena was able to put a program together. And then the response that we got from it was awesome. So um, we totally see the value in it, Gavin, and we're hoping that we can put something together again. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, okay, another question in the chat from Eliza Patterson. She says, WLA, which stands for the Working Lands Alliance, is very excited that the agency wants to support option to purchase at agricultural value. I'm curious if you would support OPAV being paid for with current available farmland preservation program funding. Uh, great question. Uh, we've been talking about OPAV and the challenges that OPAV um, presents uh, with our current funding streams for a couple of years now. Um, OPAV wouldn't be eligible for our current farmland preservation program funding. Um, those dollars are, are based on the bond uh, authorization um, that happened a number of years ago, um, and we can't add eligible uh, programs to it. Um, so my, my opinion is that's not an option um, that, uh, that we could pursue. O OPAV would require um, an additional uh, statutory uh, funding mechanism um, and, and uh, additional language that would, uh, that would allow it. Um, we have talked to a number of uh, trusts, uh, land trusts, um, about their interest in OPAV. Um, uh, I'll just be honest, there's no law that prohibits the land trust from pursuing OPAV or any other organization that uh, prohibits um, them from pursuing the option to purchase at ag value. Um, this, so, uh, you know, there's, if, if there's a will out there, there's certainly a way to get that over um, the, uh, over the hurdle. Um, I've been consistent that I support the, the Vermont model, um, which allows for the Vermont Department of Agriculture um, to do the farmland preservation, and then the uh, Vermont Farmland Trust um, owns the uh, option at ag value, um, and that they're responsible for steward stewarding that part of um, the deed restriction. Um, but that, that would require a new bond authorization. We would not be able to do that from within available uh, bonding because it's, it's a new program that wasn't authorized as part of that initial um, bond. Thanks, Commissioner. 
Um, okay, so the last question that I see in the chat is whether there's anything um, that the Department of Ag is doing specifically around poultry processing. It seems like maybe you already partially answered this question um, before, but just speaking about poultry specifically, um, what is the department working on? Yeah, um, we are actually working with a poultry processor um, uh, to get their USDA um, certification. Um, that was the, the uh, issue I raised regarding insurance. Um, previously. Um, so um, that we were able to support them with a transition grant, I think three years ago, uh, Steadfast Farms. Um, uh, Stephen put that in the, um, in the chat um, uh, to uh, expand processing capacity. Um, I will say, um, if you are looking to get in with them, contact um, Jared uh, tomorrow. Um, literally, he's, uh, he's projecting a doubling or tripling of uh, demand um, for processing. Um, so uh, it's important that you get on his list um, sooner than later. Um, but, uh, but they are there. Also, um, we've invested in a number of poultry processing um, uh, facilities um, uh, through the transition grant. Um, we visited um, Muddy Roots Farm, uh, which is a new and beginning uh, farmer. I believe they're actually members uh, of um, the New Connecticut Farmer Line, um, but they have a poultry processing facility that we were, we were able to invest in. Um, and I think there was actually, we'll be announcing in the transition grant, um, at least one other uh, farm that wanted to do poultry processing. Um, so. Uh, again, there's a, there's a demand out there. We're funding the applications that come in, um, uh, recognizing that uh, there's a huge gap in, um, you know, the the demand versus um, the uh, the capacity. Um, so, um, Andrew, you missed the opportunity for for this year for a transition grant, um, but I strongly suggest you reach out to Steadfast and uh, see what what availability they have um, to support that. Thanks, Mishnu. Um, going back to OPAF for just a moment, um, a question in the chat, could the statutory authority for funding the option to purchase the ag value with farmer preservation pro farmland preservation program money be done in a legislative session in a non-budget year? Um, so the, it's, it's not statutory authority for what we have available. We would need to do a new bond authorization. So we'd new, we would need a new program and then a new bond authorization. Um, so could that happen in, a, in this budget year? Yes, it could. Um, I don't know what the desire uh, from the legislature is on uh, new bonding amounts. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, the governor has been very hesitant to do uh, a lot of bonding over the course of the administration. Um, but um, but we would need we would need the statutory authority that, that creates the program and then a bond authorization that uh, aligns with that new statute. Um, we can't, so it, when a bond authorization goes forward, it goes forward for a specific um, statute program. So you can't just add um, program uh, access to it um, because then you're not in, in accordance with um, what the bond was for. It's like, you know, basically think about it in, in a way of, you know, if you went to the bank and you got a car loan, um, you can't go and buy a, a camper trailer. You know, that's, that's not what the, the money was made available for. Um, so we, we would be um, out of compliance. And Nick, yes, Muddy Roots can't process for others, um, uh, but I was making the point that, uh, that we did invest uh, in their processing facility. So if an individual wanted um, to, uh, to process, um, that's how we could help. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, so definitely put them in there, but I will also um, bring up one that was submitted ahead of time. Um, as extreme weather increases, what is the plan to make funding more accessible and available for farmers suffering losses? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we had a lot of conversations at the legislature um, last year. Um, and, and I can tell you that there's not a lot of desire to create a, uh, um, uh, an ad hoc disaster relief program. Um, there's um, both by, by the legislature um, and within the administration. We have USDA funding tools and, and risk management tools. Um, and, you know, we strongly encourage people to take advantage of those. Um, you know, the question came up, well, you know, if, if USDA does have uh, crop insurance and risk management tools, NAP, for instance, um, 
why why aren't people taking advantage of them if they currently exist? Um, and we know that the weather uh, challenges are getting more and more difficult each year. Um, you know, it, it seems that there should be some uh, responsibility for individual farmers to take advantage of this program. I, I support that. I mean, people should be taking advantage of, of NAP. They should be taking advantage of whole farm revenue programs. Um, I know they're not perfect programs and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination proclaiming that they are, um, but they are better than nothing. Um, for new and beginning farmers, farmers with under 10 years uh, of farm management experience, um, for historically underserved farmers, for female-led uh, farms, for veteran farms, um, they waive the application fee of the $260, um, and um, they reduce um, on a prorated basis the percentage of the buy-up fee. Um, so they're a good value. Um, you know, again, they're not going to make you whole. Um, they pay up to $350,000 um, uh, in, in insurance claims. Um, so you know, I, I think there's a there's a, an interest to do something like um, to build off something that currently exists, but I don't think there's going to be an ad hoc disaster program. Um, the the legislature, uh, Terry Wood, Representative Terry Wood, um, who represents Rocky Hill, which as some of you may be aware was um, pretty significantly impacted during the flooding uh, in July, um, put together a captive insurance program. Um, she's trying to model it after the um, crumbling foundation uh, program that the state set up more than a couple of years back now, I guess. Um, we haven't seen language. She and I have been in communication. Um, I want to learn a little bit more about what she's trying to um, uh, achieve with that and what her you know, funding source and funding mechanism would be. Uh, I appreciate the interest. I appreciate the desire. She's the house chair of the um, insurance committee. So she's got you know, one, some pretty significant um, farms in her district. She's a, a former farmer, um, one of the first certified organic farmers in the state. Um, she's trying to be responsive um, to what's out there. But as, as uh, Robert put in the, the chat here, you know, um, I strongly suggest that people contact their legislators and talk about what it means. Um, you know, we did pivot relatively quickly uh, and had our flood response grant program uh, available um, in, uh, in August to help with that, the farmland restoration, uh, climate resiliency and preparedness grant is designed to help mitigate that. Um, but we don't have a, a crop loss fund. Um, and uh, I think the legislature um, needs, needs to understand um, what the impact of, uh, of each individual farm is in their community. Yeah, thanks for that, Commissioner. Um, and thanks, Robert, for your words in the chat. Um, okay, another pre-submitted question, and this one's kind of a big one. Are there any critical issues Connecticut DOAG sees in the future of Connecticut agriculture or any market gaps, gap, market gaps that small farms can help with? I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Holly, Representative Terry Wood um, in Rocky Hill is, is the answer to the question about that. that. Um, uh, uh, gaps that we see, well, I think one that we should all be very aware of um, and, and um, paying attention to um, is the issue of PFAS in soil. Um, there's a, a lot of concern. I have a lot of concern about what that means, what that means to farming. Um, Maine has a PFAS program set up. Um, they've been able to test, I think, 56 farms, two of them needed pretty significant work um, that I think the, the department actually purchased the farm, um, but the other ones they were able to mitigate. Um, given the um, uh, amount of um, biofouls that have been spread over the uh, duration of time um, that they were spread over, um, I'm concerned that there may seem to be elevated levels. Um, the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station received uh, a position in last year's state budget um, for a technician to do PFAS testing. Um, they have the equipment. Um, we're working with them uh, deep in the Department of Public Health on setting up a program. Um, uh, this would be, this would not be your standard kind of soil uh, sample uh, testing program where an individual drives up to um, uh, the Ag Experiment Station lab and drops off um, soil in a plastic bag or a Tupperware container 
Um, this would require what would likely be deep, uh, a deep employee going out to the farm, scheduling a visit, uh, conducting a uh, soil sample in accordance with a uh, certified process, um, bringing it back to the lab, having it tested, and then uh, the results being made available to the landowner. It's specific to only farms. The, the statutory language um, specifically says farm. So um, uh, the Ag Supremation is wondering how they can determine what constitutes a farm, what doesn't constitute a farm. My opinion is if you've got a schedule F, you're a farm. If you don't, um, you're, you've got a hobby operation. Um, and that may help compel people to get their uh, schedule F. Um, but um, uh, while I was down in D.C. last week, we had an opportunity to engage with Secretary Vilsack, um, and uh, that was the question that I asked him. You know, what is, you know, what wh what is the roadmap that USDA sees on PFAS? Um, this was the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, um, so all 50 uh, departments getting together. Um, we had uh, a briefing session. There's a monthly meeting with uh, between EPA, FDA, and the USDA um, that uh, uh, NASDA members and staff can participate in uh, and listen in on. We are, we are engaging on that. Um, but they gave us a briefing on where they are uh, and the cross agency uh, working group on PFAS. We also had a conversation with an environmental lawyer. Um, and the New Mexico commissioner, uh, New Mexico had a pretty significant PFAS issue at a dairy farm uh, a couple years ago um, around PFAS. Um, and then I asked the secretary uh, about PFAS. We passed the PFAS uh, amendment to the policy book, um, uh, you know, requesting more attention and action. Um, the secretary was, um, as usual, blunt and said, you know, they asked for $20 million for PFAS remediation, uh, you know, pilot programming, and they got five. Um, you know, five's not enough, and it was sponsored by Senator Collins in Maine, and all the five went to Maine. Um, it, not saying they don't need it, um, but, you know, it was not an open uh, bid or uh, application process for states. Um, so uh, there's going to be a lot more to come uh, on this issue in the near future. I will say Secretary Vilsack, his, uh, his remarks were kind of aligned with what my feeling is, is, one, we need to understand what the action levels are. There's no, um, there's no threshold level for the amount of PFAS um, levels in soil. Um, so we need to understand when does that trigger a human health concern. There's not enough research or data on the uptake of PFAS in crops and the different types of crops. And does it get to the fruit of the crop or does it stay um, in some agreement the material that might not be used? Um, there's not an, uh, enough of an understanding of, you know, if you're doing silage corn. Um, uh, you know, and the, and the cow is eating um, all of it. Does that, does it get processed through and out of the cow or does it remain in the milk? Different studies show different things. Um, so not sure. Um, Biosolids are different than other practices. You know, biosolids are baked, processed, um, pelletized, and then spread at a rate. Other states have allowed for, um, you know, direct sewage um, or uh, wastewater. So uh, for people who don't know what PFAS is, it's the stuff that, that makes sure that nothing sticks to it. So if you've got a non-iron shirt on or, you know, wrinkle-free shirt, that's, that's got PFAS in it. Um, in Maine, they have a lot of uh, paper mills, um, right? What do you use, uh, what do you treat the paper with in order to make sure that it, you know, goes through the printer without getting jammed up? An application of PFAS. Uh, Maine allowed for the wastewater from those paper mills to be applied to farmland. That was an approved practice. So, you know, what were the PFAS levels in that water? No idea, not good though. Um, and we don't have that practice, uh, you know. So, you know, there's state by state differences that we need to figure out. Um, sewage treatment centers didn't have any responsibility or requirements to test for PFAS. So we don't allow our sewage that's treated to be turned into biosolids and then applied in Connecticut, but you could buy it in from out of state. So, um, you know, people think about uh, Boston Harbor and the Charles River and how clean it's gotten over the past 25 years. Well, part of that is because they are taking all that sludge, taking it, pelletizing it, and some of that is being applied uh, on our farmland. So they were taking it out of a direct dumping into the water and moving it to what was thought to be a better application and use for that material. Um, I don't think anybody did it. 
knowingly, I don't know that there's, you know, at that level um, that there was harm. Uh, the attorney general does have a lawsuit against, I think, 28 companies um, that knew that PFAS was harmful to human health um, and still manufactured it and distributed it uh, after they were aware of that. So um, I'm spending a lot of time on this question because this is a really serious uh, concern um, that, uh, that a lot of us in this industry have, um, and we can't um, just duck our heads and pretend that it's not going to be lingering out there. I am hopeful, um, cautiously hopeful, maybe not realistically hopeful, though, that the farm bill that gets passed this year addresses PFOS at some level that um, states can start taking some action um, because there's a lot of anxiety out there um, and people don't know what, um, what the risk is. Um, it came too late for us, but Massachusetts legislators um, uh, uh, proposed a hold harmless for farmers um, that if they applied biofiles to their farm, that they were not the target of any PFOS liabilities or risk. I think that would be a pretty good thing for, um, for the Connecticut legislature um, to pursue um, because farmers were applying it to their land based on an approved practice um, that they didn't regulate or control. Um, and we were encouraging people to apply biosolids to get it out of the wastewater stream and get it out of our, uh, our watershed. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more to come uh, on that topic, a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, but um, my concern is that the reaction is gonna move faster than the science um, and, and um, we're going to do something based or law will be passed that's not based on the science of it or the health threshold, but based on a concern um, that uh, that might risk, excuse me, uh, put farmers at risk for something that um, they didn't um, uh, actively try to do or knowingly try to harm anybody. So um, that's the big one. Uh, back to back to the other piece, you know, the the, the deficiencies in the marketplace. Um, we were down um, in um, a couple of folks on the call. Um, we're down at the big Connecticut food event where uh, Dean Andrew D. Chowby, myself, Charlie um, from Chabasso, and um, Catrice from Reset. We're talking about this. You know, where where are the gaps? And um, you know, the the big piece that I see is this this value added process. Um, one of the grants again, you know. Uh, I'm glad I reviewed these grants before coming on today. We had that, that scheduled, Jamie. Thanks for putting that on the calendar. Um, but one of them, uh, one of the grants is going to do, you know, commercial kitchen uh, uh, installation and light processing. Um, so peeling and chopping of carrots and onions and you know, little things like that. We know that you know the consumer will pay you know three to five dollars for a couple pounds of bagged onions um, at the grocery store at a farmer's market or farm stand. We also know that they'll pay three bucks for a half a pound of dice onion. So, um, you know, this is a way to get a lot more money out of the same product with a little bit of effort. Now that initial investment in the commercial kitchen is big. I'm not gonna, you know, discount, discount that at all. But we need to help farms that are willing to do that in order to get to that next peak. Um, another one is uh, um, the, 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 this farm had 28,000 pounds of product that they couldn't sell was uh, not, uh, not the right market size. Um, and they are going to be purchasing a steam bagging uh, equipment. So they will, they'll be a packed food. So you could basically throw you know, the, the steam uh, uh, frozen vegetables you see at the grocery store, very similar, but with fresh Connecticut farm product. Um, again, how much are we going to be able to upsell that to the consumer? Probably a couple bucks per pound. Um, you know, those are ways, and that was, you know, as we were talking about this earlier today, 28,500 pounds of waste product um, now moving into a revenue stream. You know, I'm, I said, just think about it. If they're charging $2 a pound, which I'm sure they're going to be charging more than that, and I hope they are, and I, I bet you the consumer would pay for it. But that's almost sixty thousand dollars of new revenue that last year they were throwing away. That's a huge increase, right? That's meaningful. Um, now, hard time getting the initial investment money uh, up front to to purchase that product. Um, but this is a great way um, to extend and expand lines of revenue. Um, Stephen put in a shared commercial kitchen space. We've made investments uh, in our food hubs around the state, and we'll continue to do that because they're. 
tremendous resources for local farmers. Um, and if anybody doesn't know where the nearest one is, let us know. We'll, we'll put you in touch with them because um, the more excuse me, the more activity they get, the stronger they are. Stronger they are, the bigger they can become. And we're moving up the we're moving up the cycle here. So um, and that's a big one. Land access uh, is going to continue to be a challenge. Cost of production is going to be a challenge. The um, uh, census data point had um, farm revenues up 90% uh, in 2022 over 2017. Um, but they didn't say what the cost of production was. So if, you're, if your farm revenue is up 90% and your cost of production is up 100%, you're still net negative, right? So that doesn't get us anywhere. Um, they didn't really, I don't know that they didn't collect that number, but it wasn't a, a part of the release. Um, so, you know, us trying to use our grant to um, increase resiliency against the weather events that are being thrown at us through our, our restoration resiliency preparedness grant program, um, hugely important. Our individual work with uh, transition grants, helping farms move from where they are to where they need to be um, is, um, is a tremendous investment on, on the individual farm level. Climate Smart Ag and Forestry Grant, MC, right? Uh, you, you're part of that cohort. Um, developing practices, creating tools, driving down the cost of production, and increasing resiliency is going to be hugely important to that. Um, increasing market uh, and market access and awareness to things like the Kinetic Drone for Connecticut Kids is going to increase uh, revenue streams uh, to uh, organizations that weren't previously eligible. Um, so we're looking at a whole farm whole industry um, uh, uh, basis, and then, then driving home where we can, where we think we'll have the most impact. Um, will we be successful? I mean, I certainly hope so. I mean, I think the, some of the, you know, uh, Alicia, your, your story, um, I think, you know, next year when we talk again, uh, hopefully before then, quite honestly, um, I think your story is going to be a great story. I think you're going to be able to demonstrate that that investment was, was really worthwhile and impactful. Um, and it's those stories that are going to make sure that, you know, the next person who joins this call in the future says, oh, wait, there's a grant for that. And, and this person received it. Maybe I should apply. Maybe I should call them. Maybe I should visit their farm um, to understand how it works for them and how I can apply that to mine. Um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard work, um, but we're doing a lot of it. And, and, you know, Jamie and I didn't mention this. Um, but if you haven't engaged with any of our team members at DOAG, um, then, you know, uh, you need to. We have one of the strongest teams uh, in state government um, in, in our grants program. They, they are dedicated, they listen, um, they try to work through the challenges that, uh, that you bring. Um, and um, I can't say enough nice things about the, the amount of work they produce. Um, we've had about 40 million new dollars come through the agency in the past five years. Um, we have not tremendously increased the amount of staff that we have that work on grants programs. Um, so we're doing a lot more work. And as I demonstrated in the PowerPoint, there's a lot further reach with a lot more impact um, with not a lot more people. Um, so um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it is um, a great team that we have there, people who are trying to be helpful. Uh, I know there's a, a couple more questions and you know, I want to be respectful of time. And um, I, I, I don't know that I addressed that question fully, but I think I got most of the corners on that one. Yeah, you did a great job. It was a, it was a very far reaching question. Um, all right, I think I'm going to try to squeeze two more questions in here if we can. The first being from Nick Weinstock. There's a livestock farm in the state that is making national news about neighboring property damage with escaped animals. This is causing a bad name for farms in general. I've seen multiple discussions about this issue online with nationwide discussion groups. Is DOAG taking any action to address this issue and control the facts that are out there? So what I can say on that is it's an open investigation and I can't say anything else. Okay. Got it. Um, and then Stephen Thompson asks, what does the Connecticut Department of Ag have to do to get the CT Siting Council to listen to any of their recommendations? I've been looking at some of your letters, Commissioner, in regards to prime farmlands being given to solar without much consideration or a real plan for agrivoltaics. It seems like beep and DOAG opinions get steamrolled. Um, you know, we work with what we got, um, quite honestly. And... Um, you know, the landowner has a lot of rights um, a, a, on what they do with their property. And, and we are trying to balance those rights with our 
um, desire to protect natural resources. Um, but there's no statute uh, that that denies or or removes or uh, limits the landowner's rights. Um, so I would disagree, Steve. I would say that they are listening to us. Um, we're doing the best we can with the amount of flexibility we have, because remember, anything that we get regarding agrivoltaic is more than what we would have got. So you know, uh, and it, it kind of stinks to be in the middle of the spectrum and and you know, you're looking one way and I'm looking at the other, looking at, you know, what we achieved and you're looking at where we could go. Um, but the, the reality is that the, the developers don't need to go through DOAG at all. They could go directly to the siting council with no agrivoltaic plan uh, for, their, for their property. Um, so it's a tricky issue. Um, the ag viability is going to require uh, more lines of revenue coming in to, to farms. Um, we do our best to work with the landowner and the developer to put those, those arrays on the marginal land outside of the, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, private and important soils. Um, but the reality is, is that we cannot tell them what to do. We cannot stop the project from going forward. Um, and um, there's no state uh, that has a program that limits um, the landowner's uh, ability to put solar on there. So I, would I love to see, you know, uh, projects a little bit different, a little bit uh, more dynamic, agrivoltaic projects? You bet. Um, do I know that it's going to increase the cost of a project significantly? Yes. Uh, do I realize that if we if we're too hard uh, on our on our agrivoltaic request, that they don't have to listen to us at all and could do 100% solar arrays, you know, low to the ground, uh, no spacing between the array and the individual solar cells? Yes. So we are um, trying to leverage uh, the tools that we have to the best of our ability, recognizing that the, uh, the other outcome could be significantly worse. Um, and that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the, the challenge of it. Um, we have talked about at different levels um, regarding uh, adders. That's what uh, Massachusetts does. They have a program where uh, you can apply for an agrivoltaic take um, uh, adder, which means um, that uh, the utility will pay you more um, for an agrivoltaic uh, operation that um, has higher arrays space differently that allows more sunlight to come in, um, recognizing that it's a, a higher cost um, for the installation and maintenance. Um, <clears throat> There's not a lot of funding available for that, um, quite honestly, uh, with the, the way the state budget currently sits. Um, to give you an idea, Jamie and I and Eileen on our team went and visited one of the operations to actually farms in Massachusetts, um, one that's a commercial operation. Um, and it was about 150, 150% of what the going electric rate was, is what they were receiving to do that. Um, so it's a pretty significant investment, and that was a two and a half acre um, installation. Um, this was the first year they they got the array up, um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what the production was. They were growing what broccoli and cabbage under their Jamie. Um, I think it was what the two crops were. Um, but yeah, uh, it was um, broccoli, broccoli and cabbage. Um, kind of an interesting, but it, but there's a huge cost. I mean, you know, the going rate for solar in Massachusetts is eight cents a kilowatt hour. He was getting paid twenty one cents a kilowatt hour. So. You know, when you think about that on a on a you know a, a universal level, um, th that requires a significant um, investment um, that uh, that uh, would be required from the state. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, yeah, a lot to say about agrivoltaics. I feel like we just have barely scratched the surface, but maybe we can do another <laughs> another event on that for our members as well. Um, I do want to wrap up here. It's getting towards 8 p.m., but before we do, I'll just put a link in the chat to register for the new CT Farmer Alliance Hootenanny. That'll be on February 25th. It's really fun. If you register, you get two drink tickets um, and you get to weigh in on NICTFA's programming for the, um, for the year to come. I also just want to say thank you, Commissioner and Jamie, for taking the time and for your presentation. Um, I especially really appreciate all the information you gave about the ways that the department is trying to implement their DEI working group um, recommendations. 
obviously we have a really long way to go here in Connecticut towards reaching racial justice in agriculture, but your efforts are seen and they're appreciated. Um, and I look forward to, you know, watching them to continue to progress. Robert, did you have something to add to that or were you going to say a similar thing? No, no, thank you. Thank you, MC. I just, I know we've, or I should say I have in the past beaten up the commissioner and, and Jamie over some of the um, shortcomings that we've had um, with the department in the past with regard to supporting BIPOC farmers. And I just want to express um, my sincere gratitude to all the progress that you guys have made this year with all the grant programs that now prioritize um, recommendations from the DI report. Um, just want to thank you guys. Great job. And congratulations. Thank you. I, I won't say you, you beat us up. You were frank with us. And I just want to say I, I appreciate the, the recognition, but I also appreciate your effort um, and your continuing you know, conversations with the department, your work on the DEI working group um, to make sure that uh, that we're aware of what's happening um, and and can do our best to pivot where we can and apply resources when uh, when we can. So um, that that feedback is always helpful. Um, and uh, and I think we're, you know, as MC mentioned, you know, we're moving. We're not we're not done. Got plenty of plenty of uh, time and space to continue operating in, um, but we're off to a good start. And uh, and that DEI working group uh, and the report that uh, that they released was very really helpful um, in creating a roadmap and identifying um, areas that we could um, invest time, energy, and resources in to, to move in this direction. Finally, I would just um, echo Jamie's call in the chat to subscribe to the DOAG newsletter. It is a really helpful resource for folks um, and to, yeah, reach out to, to people in the DOAG team. Um, I really highly recommend if you have follow-up questions, the commissioner and uh, his team are, are very available and probably would be thrilled to talk to you. Um, commissioner or Jamie, anything to add? I, I would just say, you know, we do this once a year as kind of a broad base, you know, big spectrum overview. Um, it doesn't work if we only talk once a year, right? So don't hesitate to reach out um, to us. Don't hesitate to reach out with questions, with thoughts, concerns, issues. Um, you know, uh, I'm very aware that we can't fix problems that we don't know about, um, you know, we can only be as responsive as to the information we have. Um, so we've done a lot of work on the grant program, tweaking that and trying to be more responsive. A lot of that was due to feedback um, that we received from the ag community about the challenges that they had with our grants program or, or things that were working really well. Um, so, you know, our, our, our grant, most of our grant deadlines have passed um, for the time being. Um, but if you're thinking about something, we can be a resource. So engage um, with our team. We can help to try to facilitate and navigate. You know, I, I tried my best um, to, to not use acronyms on this presentation um, because there's a alphabet soup out there. Um, and there's a lot of different organizations that do a lot of different things. And as I said on the front end of this, um, you know, we have our lane, um, but UConn Extension has a really important lane. Um, Farm Credit East has a really important lane. USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Service Agency, Rural Development all have really important lanes. Um, so let us help you navigate through, you know, which is the right channel um, that might be able to uh, support the challenge that you're facing to, to resolution. Um, uh, but take advantage of that. We do office hours regularly on our grant program. Dial into them. Um, we record them. So if you can't dial in because you've got a conflict, you can watch them later, um, but then send us an email. Say, hey, I didn't, I didn't see this being addressed, you know, or I'm thinking about doing this on my farm. Would this be eligible? Or, you know, if not, what else could be? You know, we can help work through that. We can't write the grant for you, um, but we can and really help, um, you know, help people navigate through these these processes. You know, my my opinion is, you guys are farmers. I want to make sure that you're a successful farmer. So the more focus and attention you can have on your farm, the more likely you're going to be successful. If we can remove some of the other stuff that needs to happen and help you support it, the, the other um, grant work or, or uh, programs that are out there, then that's you know a great role for us to be in. 
um, because we want to make sure that you have the ability to focus uh, focus on the farm and, and what you're working on. Um, so again, MC, thank you so much for reaching out, for, for offering to put this together. I also um, want to acknowledge um, that we have typically done this later in the year. Um, and MC was, uh, was specific to say we want to do it at the, at the beginning of the legislative session so that um, members would be aware of what's happening at the legislature, have an opportunity to engage their legislators. I strongly encourage um, each of you to invite your legislator uh, to your farm. You have two. You've got a state rep and a state senator. Um, invite them to the farm. Contact us. I'd be happy to get out there or have one of our team members get out there um, to join you. Um, to talk about our programs, to talk about the impact uh, that they have, but also just talk about agriculture in the state. Um, you know, we have fewer and fewer people who are aware of what goes on on a farm in the Connecticut legislature than at any point uh, in, in previously in history. So we've got to we've got to be diligent in making sure that they understand the value um, that each individual farm brings, so they can understand the larger picture um, that we try to present to them when we do, when we have conversations uh, over at the state capitol. That's such a great point. Um, and definitely join the NICFA policy working group if that's a skill set that you want to develop. I know it can feel scary sometimes to talk to legislators, but um, you all could do it. I, I once thought I couldn't do it, but it's not so hard in the end. Um, all right. Well, well, yeah, true. <laughs> um, with that, I will wrap us up and um, let you all enjoy your evenings. Thank you so much again to Commissioner Hurlbert and Director Jamie Smith for coming and for all of you for attending. I really feel excited about building the capacity of our farmer community to be, you know, engaged in these policy decision making conversations. Um, so I think as much as our farmer community can stay up to date on policy and know what's going on at DOAG, um, we'll be stronger and be able to build a better future for ag together. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night.